You're listening to Dirty Feet, a dance podcast. I'm Alison Elizabeth Burns. All right, today I have a very special guest. I'm going to be speaking with Anna Gerasim, who is a Romanian-born uh, dance artist, but not only dance, she's also a photographer and a writer and an educator. Uh, but of course, for our purposes on Dirty Feet, we're going to be focusing on uh, the dance part of her of her journey and of her uh, current portfolio and, and what she's doing with her time. Uh, she is the director of Zucar, a Latin dance company based here in Ottawa, uh, where I uh, actually took my first salsa lessons. Uh, we will talk about the studio, certainly. We're also going to talk about um, what, what has happened in the recent years to adapt to, you know, the situation that will not be named, and what the studio is now doing for offering online classes. And beyond that, we're going to be talking a bit about uh, inclusion in in social dance and uh, some things that Anna is exploring in terms of consent in social dance. I'm really excited to hear more about that. Um, But before we even get there, I want to talk about Anna's origin story, because I had the pleasure of hearing uh, a bit about Hannah's relationship with dance and its evolution over her over her upbringing and her adult life, and it's quite fascinating. So, uh, first of all, Anna, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, being here in the sense of uh, you know meeting with me over Zoom <laughs> to make this interview a thing. <laughs> that is what what meeting means these days. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, but I would like to start, Anna, if you will. How do you introduce yourself in a professional setting? If someone's like, here, this is my friend Anna, and Anna blank. <laughs> Who is Anna? Uh, yeah, great question. I do wear a lot of different hats, so I guess it would be dependent on who's asking. But in a dance context, I am a Latin dancer and a Latin dance educator. Uh, like you said, I'm the director of Asuka Latin Dance Company, which is a local dance school. Um, I'm also an event organizer. I mostly, uh, the biggest thing that I do is I organize uh, Salsa at City Hall, which used to be an annual event, and I'm hoping to bring it back this year, fingers crossed. And just generally a dance nerd, organization nerd, and social inclusion nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I often refer to myself as a dance nerd. I haven't heard other people use that term for themselves yet, but I, I use it so lovingly. <laughs> well, I am glad that I, I am in good company then. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so can, can we rewind all the way back to Romania and mm-hmm. and? kind of the the environment in which you were you were raised in relationship to to dance yeah absolutely so um my parents tried to put me in various types of da- dance classes as a kid as well as in gymnastics piano violin choir i'm sure i'm forgetting some things and um it didn't work out very well because as a kid and i'm not saying that this is just my parents doing i actually blame my teachers more for this um I was always sort of groomed for excellence, which sounds great, except um, I find that it actually hurt me creatively because I wasn't really given the space to just explore my creativity without there being expectations or judgment or a goal. Um, So every time I took whatever kind of class it was, even though I was, you know, a four-year-old kid, the expectation was be good at it or don't bother. Um, and the teachers that I had tended to be more interested in just discovering natural talent and nurturing that, which I did not have. Um, and they weren't so much interested in working with the rest of the kids who didn't necessarily just get it, who wanted to just have fun with it and didn't aspire to be the next great whatever. They just wanted to explore, you know, uh, an area of their creativity. So because of that, I weeded myself out of every creative thing that I tried up until the age of, oh, I don't know, sometime in my teens when I stopped trying, because every time I tried to take a new dance class or tried to pick up learning how to play an instrument uh, or tried to draw, um, there was always this expectation of trying to be the best at it. Um, And I did not feel like I had either the innate or the learned background to do that. 
So long story short, I grew up thinking that I had two left feet and no rhythm and I had no place in a dance studio or on a dance floor. Um, and that fear sort of prevented me from trying into my maybe mid 20s, which actually kind of worked out because by the time that I got over myself and tried to learn to dance, um, despite myself, I was kind of dragged into it by somebody that I was dating at the time. I was in my mid-twenties, and what was great was that by that point, there was no longer any expectation that I was supposed to be some prodigy or the next world champion, um, and it was okay to take classes and to just dance for the fun of it, regardless of whether I was any good at it or not. Which, ironically, that lack of pressure is what allowed me to get good at it. Yeah, so I started dancing in my mid-twenties. I was very determined to be bad at it and to hate it, because, like I said, I was kind of dragged into it. And uh, I was very surprised when I was not as terrible as I thought I was, and when nobody kicked me out of a class for being too, like below the level of the class. <laughs> um, and when... I think the biggest shock I had is that I started to enjoy it. And gradually I started doing it, you know, not just for fun, but trying to get better. Um, and that somehow led into teaching and then became what I do for a living, which I'm still sometimes surprised at. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if that, if that, Little girl, if you could go back and be like, actually, you're going to end up building a career based on creative pursuits of all kinds. <laughs> Would you have uh, yeah, believed right. yourself? <laughs> oh, absolutely not. Um, I made not being creative into sort of my identity growing up. Um, and interestingly, I always had very, very creative friends, very artistic friends. Some of them were dancers or singers or um uh, poets or uh, just generally musicians and one guy was really really good at drawing caricatures and our inside joke was always that they were going to grow up to be artists and I was going to be their manager hmm. yeah hmm. and again ironically I'm now the one that sort of makes a living through art and through creative pursuits and they have moved on to far more serious and grown-up things but at the same time, you're you're the director of the zoo car. Like you you're you still have that maybe that management angle in there, regardless of your of your creative brain now. Yeah, you, you've used both worlds. The the organization and the management comes much more naturally because it fits much more neatly into the way that sort of my brain was trained to function from a young age. So, um, which I think in a creative world or in, in terms of the arts, is also helpful because oftentimes people who are very artistic tend to de-emphasize the very organizational, practical aspect um, of their work, and it becomes this dichotomy where you're either creative or you're organized, you're either good at business or you're an artist. Um, and in a world where a lot of artists are self-employed and have to sort of take on this mantle of promoting themselves and um, and managing themselves, it can be not just difficult for them to pick it up, but also we're sort of taught that if you're an artist, you need to not prioritize and not treasure these aspects of running a business. You're, you're kind of taught to be above them in some ways, um, which I think hurts a lot of artists and makes, you know, the whole stereotype of uh, the chaotic artist who's going to starve um, endure in a place and in a world where I don't think that needs to be the truth anymore. Absolutely. I I was educated in, with a bachelor's in contemporary dance. And even through that um, stream, there is so little emphasis on really practical tools that you need if you want to pursue the arts like grant writing, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, or even researching, you know, funding or structures for your company. Um, 
yeah, there's just a lot of, a lot of emphasis on, on one stream or another, like you're saying, mm-hmm. um, when in reality, a lot of artists these days are independent mm-hmm. and they need those business skills. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm not saying that every artist needs to be both because we can't all be Renaissance men and women. But um, I think if these skills are not necessarily taught to the same extent, because I know that people also have to specialize at some point, um, maybe creating more sort of linkages between and partnerships between an mm-hmm. artist and somebody who manages them or a group that can provide support would also be good, which is something that I've kind of toyed with in the past, never really got it off the ground, but maybe at some point when I'm, you know, com- when I've completely worn out my joints, I can focus on doing that. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good point. Such structures do exist. Um, I think once you reach a certain level, I think Mm -hmm. it's I think it's really the tragedy of it is that you have less support, the smaller you are and the younger you are and the Mm -hmm. more you're starting out, you have to kind of figure it out on your own versus like when you're at a stage when you can start outsourcing some of those tasks and building a bigger team. And yeah, so it, it it is really great if you can, as a young person, meet somebody who likes hanging out with artists and wants to manage them. I mean, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been the dream. But, you know, yeah. I left Romania and I left my creative friends and then they went and grew up. What's up with that? <laughs> right. So on that trajectory, uh, being dragged, kicking and screaming into a dance class. Uh, I want to talk about w- what was different in this context. So you were doing this in Canada mm-hmm. when you when you started, and you were doing social dance specifically. Does that differ from what you were le- learning in uh, Romania as a child? Yes, definitely. So um, my first successful attempt at learning to dance was salsa dancing, which is very, very different than, you know, the... the rhythmic gymnastics and ballet classes that I tried to take as a kid. Mm -hmm. Um, First of all, it's Latin social dancing is meant to be mostly for fun, especially when adults learn it. We're not going into it. I mean, some people do still go into um, the competitive stream of it, and some people do become, you know, amazing competitive dancers, but that's not usually the goal when people start out. When people start out, usually they think, oh, I want to learn how to do this so that I can have fun and go to a club or go to a social. Um, And that removes a lot of the emphasis on strict technique and form, which for a street dance like salsa is not really as big as it is for ballet. Um, And also you're not expected to perform, right? So a lot of um, the classical dances that we think of they're they are stage dances they're performance dances it's not something that you can you can just go and do socially for fun in a room with a dj and the bar (laughs) (laughs) that brings to mind kind of an interesting picture right (laughs) yeah absolutely (laughs) whereas partner social dances are sort of at this interesting intersection of, you know, art and fitness and the social activity and the cultural experience, um, which nobody knows what to do with us in terms of uh, where we fit as businesses, which was a whole interesting thing during COVID, but that's a whole other topic. But yeah, um, Mm. um, that parenthetical aside, um, it was much less pressure to start learning salsa because, again, you're not expected to just be good at it. The other thing that made a huge difference is that I had extremely patient teachers who didn't see it as their job to find and foster talent and create the best dancers that they could. Their job, the way that they saw it, was to take everybody who wanted to dance and find ways to help them learn to whatever extent that they could and at whatever pace they needed and using whatever methods were available and worked in order for this person to feel like they had learned something new that they could enjoy as opposed to this is the structure of the dance and this is the technique of the dance and this is the way you need to move in order to do it right. And that made a huge difference. Yeah, that makes sense. 
I'm wondering, there's, there's like two aha moments. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm wondering if you can nail down the first being when did you when did you notice or realize, oh, I'm good at this? <laughs> oh, that took about a year and a half. Um, <laughs> I think my biggest realization, my biggest aha moment was, at the very beginning, I refused to take group classes. I would only ever um, learn or practice uh, with the person that I was dating alone with nobody else watching. And it took several months for him to convince me to try and go to a group class. And the only group class that I would go to was one for complete beginners where I knew that they would be, um, that I would be learning the same moves that I already knew (laughs) because that was the only way that I could convince myself that maybe I won't be the worst one in the class because I already kind of have an idea of what I'm supposed to do. And so I went to that class and not only was I not the worst one for knowing, for learning the moves that I already knew, but they threw things at me that I hadn't seen before. And that was less terrifying than I thought. And I learned them at either at the same pace as everybody else or maybe a little bit faster. And that experience of not being or maybe not feeling like the worst person in the class was a big aha moment for me because I had convinced myself that this is something that I would hmm. always be the worst at. Hmm. Um Despite that, I still said, you know, this is not something that's ever going to be for me and I'm not going to enjoy it and I'm never going to be any good at it <laughs> for another year and a bit. Um, and then when I started catching myself wanting to go to socials and uh, when I started dragging my partner out to dance instead of it being the other way around, um, that's when I started thinking, OK, maybe I'm being stupid and maybe this is something that I actually like. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> Beautiful. So we, we've nailed down when you realized you were good at it, when you realized you liked it. And the last I want to know, when did you realize, oh, I'm going to do something big with this? And and I mean, like, you, you directing this company, like you, you <laughs> teaching it, you went in the completely all in. So so when did that decision happen? That decision happened in May of 2012. Um, when we decided to start our own school at this point, we had already been teaching with a different school for a couple of years and it was, it was a really good learning experience to learn how to teach dance. I had had a background in in teaching before. I've always sort of been a teacher in some form or another, but teaching dance was a whole new thing to teach movement was very new to me. Um, So I learned how to do that. And I started because of, you know, my organizational nerd brain, I started seeing things that maybe could be done better. It's like, how about we promote this to these people? I'm noticing that we're getting, you know, only word of mouth. How about we start doing this and this and this and update the website? And how about we get a new logo? And I, all of the ideas that I had, I noticed were geared towards running this dance school that was run by some very lovely people, but kind of as a hobby on the side of, you know, their day job and their family life, Um, but running it more as a business, Uh, which was something that they weren't terribly interested in because they were happy with their day day jobs and they had their family lives. And a lot of them were having, you know, young children, uh, which take up a lot of time and energy, as I'm sure you know. (laughs) (laughs) I'm learning. (laughs) (laughs) And they weren't really in a state of mind to want to make this big upheaval and to turn their, uh, their dance school that was sort of their getaway from their daily life into a career or into a business. And, um, I said, well, I think I want to do that. And I think I want to see if I can scale this up beyond it being something that people do as a side hustle or as a hobby and into something that can maybe be self-sustaining. And because I had been gathering all of these ideas that I initially wanted to apply to a different school for the last couple of years, when we decided to open our school, we also, we almost had a ready-made business plan. Um, 
and we found a space and we rented it in June and we opened up in September and we were born basically Azucar was born Wonderful. So let's let's carry on this path of Azucar mm-hmm. and let's talk uh, briefly about what has happened in the last couple of years with the studio and and how you know you've had to pivot and adapt and all those <laughs> key words we've been hearing a lot of. Oh boy. Um yeah, so almost two years to the day. Wow. When we're recording this, um we had heard that COVID was coming and restrictions were starting to loom large and we had shut down for one weekend to see what was going to happen and it sounded like we were going to be closed for two weeks remember that (laughs) yep (laughs) so our reaction to that was to go all right let's get into the studio and let's record some videos of what the people who have signed up for the classes that we're canceling would be learning and just in case if we do end up being closed for two weeks let's record those as well (laughs) Um, and then when the two weeks got extended to a month and then two months, we just, we had these very, very long recording sessions of all of our material to make sure that people who had paid for the classes that were now being canceled, don't lose out on those classes. Um, and as we were recording all these videos, we thought, well, this maybe is a good opportunity to also build up a library of videos, which we can then offer online later. Um, And for the next year or so, it was this endless pivoting between a whole bunch of different business models, where it felt like I had to come up with a new plan every month, (laughs) in between Mm -hmm. when when can we go back to the studio, um, to what extent do we want to do live classes or hybrid classes, or pre-recorded classes that people can take at any point, or courses that um, have a beginning and an end, and every week people get new material versus, you know, courses that are just there and people can access them at any time. So um, in the summer, we also taught some classes outside, which are so much fun, and I can't wait to do that again. (laughs) Um, So it was just jumping from one way of doing things to another and pivoting very quickly, which was... It was good to see and to explore what is possible, but it also just took a big toll on us and on on me especially because I was sort of in the middle of all of it, Um, just emotionally and mentally. It was pretty draining. Um, So towards the tail end of all of that, we launched our online platform, which is called Asukar Online, and we offer a few different beginner classes. We also offer a library of salsa moves to where you can kind of like learn moves on demand. Um, A couple of different uh, more intermediate advanced courses as well. We also started uh, doing a little bit more with our YouTube channel, um, everything from little dance tutorials to just, you know, talking head kind of videos about various topics of interest in the dance community. And um, we sort of geared more towards this video creation and editing and uh, type of process and less of the in-person classes, which I didn't really want to start up again before we could be sure that restrictions wouldn't keep coming back, just because it was kind of interesting to deal with booking studios and then never really being sure whether you could keep those bookings or whether they would be canceled. Um, I feel like I talked about a lot of different things. <laughs> yeah, you did. This was great. No, I, I heard that a lot that, um, well, you know, and I've, I've lived it as well. You, you had to be flexible over the last two years, right? Mm-hmm. You, you, you would keep making plans and it would keep getting scrapped and you'd have to, you'd have to adapt and adapt and adapt. Um, what I found really interesting in what you were saying is you, you right away <laughs> went to video recording, um, which I think is where people landed after a lot of trial and error. So you mm-hmm. kind of, you hit the ground running with that, it sounds like. Um, and now, and now there's this archive, right? The, mm-hmm. This resource for, for people, which is great, uh, in terms of accessibility. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, there's like already a few avenues that we can use to kind of segue into, into the next section of our, our conversation. I'm wondering if you, if you felt, uh, comfortable talking about how you landed on the research you ended up doing recently, um, kind of at the end of your burnout and, mm-hmm. and where that went. Yeah, absolutely. So after about a year and a half of 
dealing with the constant changes and having to pivot, um, I really wasn't feeling inspired to do anything anymore. And it took me a, quite a while to figure out that what I was feeling was being was that I was burnt out. So towards the tail end of 2021, I took a, a couple of months off, which stretched into a couple more months off to just re- step away from everything, have a break and um, get some therapy and just work on my mental health, which has been wonderful. Um, now, I don't know if I'm... Everybody likes to talk about, you know, burnt out after they're, they've come out on the other side of it. I don't know that I'm fully on the other side of it yet. And I also don't think we hear enough about, you know, this step in the recovery process where you feel miles better than you did before, but you're still not entirely sure how close to normal you are again. <laughs> um to where I want to get back into the swing of things, but I also don't know to what extent I have the capacity to do that without coming back into my old patterns and burning myself out again. Um, But taking the time away from the dance community has sort of let me do a little bit of research and also just watch what's happening in the dance community. And what I landed on were um, a few different things that I had been seeing kind of emerge, but I had never really given that much time to looking into things like uh, the issue of safety in the dance community, because like any community, we have, you know, 90 something percent wonderful people. And then you have some less than great people that, especially in a context where there's a lot of close contact and where these dances that are deemed sensual dances, um, some people find ways of taking those too far and making people uncomfortable. And I was thinking, well, we don't really have a great, first of all, a great education system for people to Uh, learn what's okay and what's not okay. Uh, We don't really have a great reporting system for what do you do when somebody makes you feel unsafe at a social. Um, We don't really have this as part of our social dance education. Um, How do we deal with things like that? How we, especially, you know, in a post Me Too world, what does that mean for dance? How do we bring that conversation about consent into social dancing, uh, which feels for some people like a way to do all of the things that we don't necessarily get to do in society, like touch each other. (laughs) Um, And how do we introduce that aspect uh, while still keeping it fun and not policing everybody on the dance floor? Um, The other types of conversations that I've been having here and there um, regarding how can we make this community more inclusive of people who maybe are in the LGBTQ plus community? Um, How do we make these dances that are traditionally, quote unquote, traditionally very gendered in terms of you have a lead and a follow and the lead is typically a man and the follow is typically a woman and it's very this very heteronormative kind of an environment. How do we make that less gendered and less heteronormative and how do we open it up more so that people can feel included regardless of their sexual orientation or their gender presentation? Um, how do we leave room for those individual differences and preferences without discriminating? Um, How do we handle things like rejection (laughs) on the dance floor without without creating a toxic community? Um, So I've been doing a lot of thinking around those things, and um, there's a lot of stuff that I have in the works um, around it because I think social dancing is a great space to have those conversations, which obviously are not um, topics only relevant to dance or even just a social dance, but these are discussions that are being had more broadly at a social level where they are very important to have, but I also feel like they carry such a large emotional charge and emotional load at that social level, whereas the dance floor, the social dance floor, because it's a less serious space um, and because the stakes aren't quite as high, I think can be great as a sandbox to have these conversations. So what I'm 
working on is sort of a, a diversity and inclusion and consent framework, which sounds very government, um, but I'll try to make it a little bit this year <laughs> that I hope to share with the Latin dance community and hope to see implemented at socials and also maybe by dance schools. I'm um, working on sort of revamping my school's curriculum to have more of, a, of an emphasis on things like choosing your dance role regardless of your genitals <laughs> um, and uh, things like how do you react and how do you set your boundaries in the dance context? How do you communicate what's okay and what's not okay for you personally? Um, as well as I'm working on a series of workshops that I can hopefully teach in the context of these socials where typically you start the night with a little bit of a workshop um, done by various dance schools. And I would like to teach workshops that fuse dance with these discussions that are sort of part dance etiquette and part social inclusion, um, which all sounds very vague and nebulous. <laughs> and that's because it's still very much in process. Um, but I'm hoping to do that starting this spring and summer. And um, I'm hoping that at the very least that generates a little bit more discussion. That sounds fabulous. I when, What you were saying about it being a sandbox, the dance floor, um, makes so much sense to me. And it's it's not even just you're going to have a conversation about it. It's people actually standing on their feet or uh, interacting together in, in, in a real world scenario that's, you know, not the real world. It is mm -hmm. the dance floor. Um, but it seems like such a better place to learn those kinds of lessons mm -hmm. um, because it is more practical than just being being told, <laughs> you know, what the yeah. expectations are, but actually having to adhere to them and practice them. Exactly. And I feel like a lot of times when we have these conversations, they're very much in the context of being presented a new way of engaging with other people in theory without mm -hmm. necessarily being given the opportunity to practice that. Um, right. Some of the things that I have in mind are not necessarily new. They're things that other dance communities have been doing already. Um, I'm taking a lot of uh, inspiration from the swing dance community, which actually um, has had much more of an emphasis on the whole conversation of consent and inclusion and diversity. Um, as well as from the Zouk community, which also tends to be a little bit more progressive, whereas the Latin dance community tends to be a little bit more um, traditional, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm taking inspiration from those communities where, for instance, there have been Zouk workshops um, at various festivals where you go and you practice going to ask someone to dance and them saying mm -hmm. no to you. Amazing. <laughs> so that when that happens in real life, it's not a shock. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a mini therapy session built it into is. your dance class. <laughs> it really is. It's funny you would say that because um, one of the things that I do is I teach um, couples who are getting married and want to have their first dance be a Latin dance. Um, and very often those dance classes become mini therapy sessions around how this couple interacts with each other and how they resolve conflict and all that stuff. And it's, it makes me very happy. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. So I've done a bit of leading in my life. And I'm wondering, as as you were kind of breaking down the gender stereotypes, then you, and you're saying, okay, let's, let's select if you're going to be a lead or a follow. Mm -hmm. um, from my perspective, leading is quite difficult. You need to be paying very <laughs> close attention to the music. You need to be deciding what's happening next. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you kind of, what framework or, or guidelines would you give someone to help them decide if they were going to be a leader or follow? That's if we're, if great disrupting question. the system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love getting that question because anytime we get into the how of things, that's, that's where I live. Um, so there's two things about that. First of all, I what I want to disrupt is not so much making everybody change their dance role. Not at all. I also don't want to turn it on its head and say, from now on, women lead and men follow. That's also not the point at all. The point is to give people the opportunity to choose their dance role based on their preference rather than on their um, perceived expectation of what somebody of their gender might do. Um, and I think 
in order to do that, we have to give people kind of a sense of a little taste of what that's like, right? Because oftentimes you would go into a beginner class and your teacher would tell you, you know, there are two roles. There's a lead role and the follow role. Pick one. And in the back of my mind, the question is based on what, mm-hmm. right? So if you have no information, then the only thing that you're going to be able to base that on is, well, I've seen in, you know, stereotypical portrayals of partner dancing that somebody of my gender might do this, <laughs> right? Um, so what I'm hoping to do once we start having beginner classes again is before we get into any sort of meaningful partner dancing is to have everybody explore both roles. So pick Mm -hmm. somebody to dance with, do some lead follow exercises that don't require knowledge of any specific dance, but just this is what it's like to lead, to make somebody, to kind of invite somebody to move in a certain way. This is what it's like to follow, to get those cues and then decide how you interpret them. And then based on that knowledge, okay, which one did you prefer? Or if you didn't have a preference, toss a coin, pick one, because it's easier to learn one role at a time. If you try (laughs) to learn both, it's super confusing. (laughs) And yeah, then if you have two leads dancing together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. That's the, the only thing I do tell my students um, is if you come with a partner and you want to dance together, make sure you have opposite roles. Because <laughs> yes. otherwise, you're making it very difficult for yourself. It's just a power struggle on the, on the dance floor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I mean, that's a great a great idea. Again, you're you're bringing it right away to practical terms. It's like mm-hmm. let's not talk about it. Let's let's move about it. And let's figure it out through mm-hmm. our bodies. That's great. Yeah, I mean, that's to me, that's sort of the point of dance is whether it's expressing what you're feeling or expressing having a, a creative and artistic outlet or whether it's a way of engaging with another person, you do it through movement right? Um, And if we're going to talk about all of these issues in the context of dance, let's talk about it through movement as opposed to sitting people down and lecturing. Is there anything you want uh, a dance curious person to know at this point about how to access some of the things you spoke about dancing at City Hall, the, the video archive, the studio itself? So if anybody has listen to this and decided, oh, maybe the salsa thing is worth a try, uh, definitely check us out. Uh, we basically welcome everybody, both at Salsa at City Hall, which uh, is hopefully going to take place on Wednesdays in July and August. Um, for more information about that, just search for us on Facebook or at salsacityhall.com. Uh, if you're interested in classes, we have those online for all levels, including absolute beginners, including people who have a partner, people who don't have a partner. Um, that is at asukaronline.com. We welcome everybody and we hope that, that soon we'll be able to do that in person in a studio as well. Um, the biggest thing I would say is if you are somebody like me who thinks that you have two left feet, that's great. We will sell you dance shoes in left pairs. Um, (laughs) um, basically the biggest obstacle that I had to overcome when learning how to dance as an adult with all of the baggage that I had was not a lack of skill, but a lack of confidence and the barriers that I had were all self-imposed by me convincing myself that dance wasn't for me. Um, one of my favorite things, one of my favorite sort of Facebook memes that keeps circulating is, uh, these days, and I hope lots of people see it and take its advice is that in order for you to enjoy a hobby, you don't have to be good at it. It's okay to sing off key. It's okay to sing, to, to dance badly. It's okay to paint things that make no sense. Um, we as a culture, I think, put so much emphasis on being excellent and at only pursuing arts if we're going to be one of the top artists. Um, I think art is a beautiful, universal way of connecting with ourselves, even if that means just shaking your butt in your underwear in your living room. (laughs) Brilliant. I can't think of a better note to end this interview on. Than shaking your butt in your living room. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> but expressing yourself yes. and, and not being so stressed out about um, the quality. Just, uh, mm. yeah, enjoy it. Because ironically, not stressing out might actually make you get better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then you might end up running a dance studio. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you. You've been listening to Dirty Feet. I'm Allison Elizabeth Burns. Music for Dirty Feet by Tristan Henry. Special thanks to Paula Flalo for ongoing support and guidance. And to past contributors for amassing an almost 200 episode archive available at dirtyfeetpodcast.com. Learn more about me at allisoneb.com. This episode was created thanks to my patrons. If you would like to support the future creation of podcasts, visit patreon.com slash allisoneb dance to learn more.